uh, phishing scams. The FBI has been all over this uh, and looking at this from the standpoint that it's absolutely unprecedented. They have a 40% increase uh, in less than 30 days um, in uh, scams in general, but in particular, focusing in on the email uh, perspective, um, you know, with with uh, stay-at-home uh, employees, as uh, as most of us are on this this call, uh, you can imagine who the targets are of of the bad guys. Um, well, email, we know that 95% of the uh, cyber attacks in general originate through email. There's, there's been a, a mass increase um, in terms of the, the phishing email scams. This is a, a number that, uh, that I scouted uh, yesterday, 667% increase in phishing scams in less than 30 days. It's absolutely massive. Um, and then from a phishing scam, as you kind of go uh, down into the different types of phishing scams and so forth, impersonation is, uh, is up 250% in, in such a short period of time. Um, so obviously there's, there's a, a big opportunity for bad guys right now. And, and the reason is, is what's on your screen. Um, everybody is interested in any information on COVID-19. Anything that uh, they can learn to, to help them themselves at work or help themselves personally, just from a, you know, what, what measures should I be taking to protect myself and my family? People are not being as careful uh, when they open up uh, email. So employees are, are de definitely uh, an opportunity for an organization, but it's a risk at the same time. Um, the links, actually go back, uh, John, for just a second. Uh, the, the links can generally contain malware, ransomware, and disinformation. That's nothing new. That's what phishing email uh, 101 is. But today, uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult, even if you weren't reading it quickly, to spot phishing emails. It, it validates the point of why you need to have a layered security approach, which I'm going to get to in a second, uh, but why you need art artificial intelligence and a service. Um, that, that provides those things like message control. So um, John's gonna share uh, an example of an email that he received uh, in a moment, but uh, 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 let's go back for a second. There, oh, there we go. This was one of the best phishing emails I have ever seen. Uh, John uh, received this, it looks like it's coming from his HR department and it looks like that uh, he needs to click on uh, a link to go into a policy. So thankfully through message control, it provided a, a message that said, hey, John, stop in your tracks for a second here. This, is, this isn't right, you know? And, and of course he did the right thing and not, not opened it. You know, he follows his, his company's messages. But um, what I had on my slide is the generic message that's out there. Here it is formatted for, for his company. We'll come back to that in a, in a second. But um, so what do you do? And then we're going to head into. Uh, I'm going to walk through this uh, quickly, but then we'll we'll head into um, uh, the message control uh, side of things. But a layered security approach is it. You have to have it. If if uh, if you're not using the security that comes with your email, set it up. Set it up for your company. Set it up on behalf of your clients. You need to have it. The simple reality is is using that alone is is not enough. You, again, you need to have a layered approach. Um, if you don't have a secure email account to ensure that the other side has a security code to uh, receive essential information that, that, that your employees need to send in a secure fashion, you need to have a, a secure email account as well. That's something that Guard Street uh, brings to the table. Um, in terms of uh, multi-factor authentication, this is like a 101 thing. Um, when a perpetrator uh, hacks into an email account, uh, uh, this is a way to avoid that um, and, and also, of course, resetting the password and resetting up a, a multi-factor authentication is the way to kick them out. Um, you've, because email is so prevalent right now as, as the, the attack tool, um, uh, it's a great way to navigate through into a company network. Um, having a, a, an external vulner, vulnerability scan that runs monthly that looks at 100 plus thousand vulnerabilities is essential uh, these days. It is correlated to email. Um, they do go together. Um, 
when it comes to a, uh, a secure uh, or having a remote workforce, it goes without saying that if you have uh, security policies, great. Um, if, uh, if you haven't talked about them in a while or sent anything out to your employees in a while, send them out. If you don't have it, create it. Um, and employee training is going to get you to a point. We know that 38% uh, of, of employees are going to be clicking on everything they receive and click through. Um, if you use uh, uh, training, if you apply modules and so forth, that'll reduce it down to maybe 8%. That's still a big, a big number, especially with the volume of emails that are coming. Um, so really, you, you've got to have artificial intelligence. Your, your employees are not human phishing detectors. They can't be especially as good as these emails are getting or have gotten. You need to have message control. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, John, and let's, let's show them what, uh, uh, what the services are that, that uh, need to be in place. Thanks, Vince. Appreciate it. So message control layers behind best of breed gateway solutions, which is great because we, we don't step on anyone's toes in regards to a ATP or a TTP or some type of advanced threat protection solution, which oftentimes is necessary now um, with some form of internal impersonation protection and URL rewrite, um, you know, so on and so forth. But, you know, what's getting passed down still and we know it as people who receive email, you know, regardless of your gateway, regardless if you make that spend on Proofpoint or, you know, go with EOP protection, um, we're going to still see bad emails get through. And the reason why at heart is because these gateways do such a complicated in-depth analysis, but their remediation just boils down to a simple block deliver quarantine. And that's on the basis of, is there anything known bad? And there's such a gray area, such that large gray area space. We don't know if there's any known bad, so we're going to deliver it. This is where our code breaker and silencer comes in. And this is our human layer security bundle. So code breaker, think of standard external warnings that we see in prefixed to subject lines or on top of emails where, you know, what it traditionally is only solving for is, hey, this isn't your boss. Um, you know, this isn't someone within your organization and they come on 100% of the email. So Codebreaker offers a smart way to deliver those where people pay attention to them and they are essentially spelling out risk for your end users in you know, two short sentences on the top of an email. So you know, we all train our employees and you know, we hope they derive some type of you know, actually useful knowledge from that on how to assess emails for you know, risks because we train them because we're aware bad emails get passed down. So Codebreaker spells them out for them and empowers these users to make much better sound decisions, essentially hoping they will join your you know, security initiative. Silencer comes with this tool and Silencer is very unique where we rip out embedded email trackers, which we see in about 60% uh, at minimum of any given businesses um, in total email volume. Uh, the trackers come in, sales emails, marketing emails, um, and you know people will write them off as a nuisance. We stop that from coming in because they spray out wealths of metadata beyond I've opened the email and it's probably a good time to call me to sell me something. We see threat actors prefer this method of sending out fake emails, uh, marketing emails with no payload, but with a tracker and these simply fire when you open an email. Uh, to the entirety of a company instead of prodding firewalls for months. They get full device fingerprints from people opening up emails where in, they, where in the world they are, you know, and what they actually do with that email because it stays with the email until it's completely deleted. So it reports on these forward open activities where we see certain industries and companies use this as a BI tool or call it corporate espionage. So we rip these out and that's part of our human layer security bundle. We offer an additional add-on tool or a standalone tool. It's called Gatekeeper, and it's a DLP solution. And what we're solving for is misaddressed emails accidentally leaving the organization, you know, causing someone to have to potentially call a PR firm or a law firm or you know, send an email blast out saying, hey, can you please delete this email? So we're going to stop that email uh, before it's sent and give your user another chance to confirm 
uh, whether it's the correct address they want to send it to. And if it's not, they can just kill that email. So I'll go into Codebreaker here. And what Codebreaker is solving for is these external warnings, like I said. And the external warnings are creating a problem now. Once we add through the gateway, uh, through policies, and they come on 100% of external emails, uh, creating essentially a wallpaper effect. And it's just human psychology where people now do ignore them. You know, organizations will change the color, have them blink, but at the end of the day, they still are ignored. And you know the problem is we talk to someone 30 times, you know, an outside vendor, and every time that email has an external warning, say they're impersonated, it gets through, there's no payload, and you're on mobile, the display name's the same, and it says external. You know, by email 50, I'm a human, I'm probably not going to drill in on that display name. And that's the problem because it'll read external every way. So our warnings are dynamic. We populate on it about 10 to 30 percent of any given external email communications because we're only populating on risky or anomalous scenarios. So people actually pay attention when these warnings come. So if you guys do train uh, through a no before platform, you know, Wombat security through Proofpoint, um, you know, any type of simulated phishing or you know, any theoretical uh, classroom training, you can think of these warnings as the analysis you'd hope your end users do um, every single time an email comes in, you know, whether it's, is this the same domain as um, someone I'm talking to, or, you know, is there a weird sense of urgency from Mike? Uh, I'm not sure. So we know they get so many emails a day where, quite frankly, they probably don't apply this to every single given email. And they don't get paid extra for it. Um, they just get to keep their job. So. Sometimes it's an afterthought. So what would happen if a third party vendor is impersonated? Kind of the example I just gave before. You know, and this comes in through us talking to Alex Andrews, and Alex Andrews sends usually at partner.com. This comes in through partner.co. And on mobile, it's gonna just show the display name. So on the left is a generic external warning. And then what we would deliver on the right is the message control warning. So for the message control warning, we spell out right away on the top of the email, hey, this is a similar domain name as another company you've been speaking with, but this is their first email to your company. So where it comes into play is, we're talking to the real Alex Andrews, let's say 25 times over the past week. With our solution here, you're gonna view the real Alex Andrews email is a normal email. So no warnings would be applied. So once a strong communication pattern is established, that's any back and forth one, two, and three, no warnings get applied. So that's why people will pay attention to these because when you're talking to the real person, you actually view it like a normal email. So only when the bad email comes is when you get this specific warning. So like Vince mentioned and we went over earlier, this is a really nice one that I got um, a couple weeks ago. And we were always looking for CDC WHO ones, but this was the first one that I saw like this. And it was just extremely good where I took a screenshot of it because I've never seen a phishing email um, just so perfectly spelled out, you know, phonetically in English because we'll always see something from Southeast Asia or you know, Eastern Europe with just a little bit of wonkiness to, to the verbiage. So our warnings are gonna produce, you know, cause it was an HR, similar name to someone in your company. This is, you know, you've never replied to this person. So immediately alerting the user, hey, this is not your HR department. So they can either report the email or delete it. And so say you get a widely distributed email to a couple hundred users what they can do is report this. They get taken to a second interface. It takes them five to 10 seconds. And if they hit phishing or impersonation and report the email, we're gonna update the banner warnings to black. And not just theirs, but actually you know, all, let's say 200 people who receive this phishing email. So while the IT department does what they do to pull back emails or 
send a blast out to everyone. This is a way to update them in real time if they're sitting on the bad email that they probably shouldn't click on anything. <laughs> we try to make it very obvious. So if someone was to mark a, you know, an email incorrectly as report, what we'll do is on the back end actually check if that's a you know, real fish and then revert the warnings to the original color if it's not. Um, if it is a real fish, we federate that zero day data to the rest of our clients. So you, you and the rest of our clients get that benefit of that warning. So in case they send, you know, that same fisher sends to one of our clients, their warnings would actually be in black. This here is a, just a few smattering of some of the warnings that you would see in Codebreaker. So we cover internal impersonations, third party impersonations in yellow, any type of email spoof would be in yellow saying the sender's email address couldn't be verified. If you've ever seen a really good one uh, with a Cyrillic uh, O or a Cyrillic P in the sending domain, we're going to populate a big fat hairy warning for those uh, really sophisticated ones because even our best trained users, you know, who are drilling on every display name can't really determine whether you know, it's a Cyrillic O or English alphabet O without a magnifying glass. So we let them know to the highest degree to not interact with the email. Also, we're gonna flag any domain that was created in the last six months to help fort down on all this you know, credential harvesting and um, you know, big brand impersonations that are going on. We also tier these in different colors for severity and the blue and gray are more informational and nice to have. So that's Codebreaker. I'm going to take you into Silencer. So Silencer is a tool that typically we'll consider sits in the background, so none of the users are aware it's happening. But what it does is it removes embedded email trackers from inbound emails. And you know, like I said earlier, not only are cyber criminals liking this tool, but we see lawyers track other lawyers when they send over settlement offers to see if you know, lawyer two will forward that email out to, uh, let's say, their client to get a second pair of eyes on, and they get a nice little tracking report like this. And if you would go ahead and expand it down here, you could actually see that second device and all that information um, for the second receiver of that email. So our tool removes this, so that metadata is not spraying out to, you know, God knows who. And what it is, is, you know, these trackers are so specific and actionable. You know, the best example, the real life example is, you know, we get a sales or marketing email from Joe Schmo and we open it, don't even read it. And then two seconds later, he calls us on our office line saying, you know, hey, John, did you read my email? There's no coincidence he does that. And we're all aware that ha is happening, you know, every day, multiple times a day. Um, problem is people will write that off as a red receipt. It is totally not, as you can see. So this is a freeware tool online. You know, there's thousands of trackers out there. And these are the way people are tracking emails. So not just your traditional one by one pixel, you know, where you don't load an image and you get a little red X. People are using silent sound waves, special fonts, CSS media tags, and they're even doing it via reverse DNS lookup now. So our tool here is a behavioral tool. And what it does is it recognizes the behavior and rips out the tracking mechanism before it could hit you know, your organization's uh, inbox, essentially spraying that data out to God knows who. So we turn organizations into a, a black hole, if you may. And Gatekeeper is the final piece here. It's the DLP solution where we flip the uh, code breaker on the outbound and run real-time simulation analysis. And what we're doing is simply defending against human error. And we'll call it the fat finger problem, but we've all had it. So you know, what we're gonna do is if someone possibly misaddressed an email, you know, whether it's CC'd to a couple other people or just to an individual recipient, what we'll do is we'll say, you know, action required, you may have a misaddressed outbound email. So the sender can click send as addressed, that recipient is correct, or actually hit 
do not send. And if they do, if they do hit do not send, the user will then you know, be able to notify internal recipients that the email was withheld on that email or deliver with no notification. So that is Gatekeeper. That is uh, the message control human layer offering. So, you know, we'd like to open this up for questions, thoughts. Um, we can dive back into the to the presentation if anyone has any specific questions on any slides or concepts. So <clears throat> this is Lance. I definitely like the artificial intelligence piece of it, how it's um, you know smarter than the general notification, this is an external sender, things like that. Um, how, how often do you guys roll out additional features, functions to that to make that a little bit more intelligent? Is it something that happens automatically all the time? Are you guys, you know, coding that in the background? What, what is... Yeah, that's what happening. That like? So it's happening all the time. And mm -hmm. also when, you know, when the uh, tool is installed in anyone's environment, it just gets smarter over time because it is a machine learning tool with AI. So it just learns all the time and gets smarter and better over time. But when we do release updates, we'll let everyone know, but we grandfather those updates uh, to our product for everyone. And we can do it unless it's a, a huge overhaul, which we have never done or don't need to do, um, then you know it would just be all on our back end. Okay. And then uh, Silencer, I know um, when we had uh, seen some presentation information before on that one. So um, if, you, if you could bring that slide back up, it, I believe Silencer will, will strip some of that information out and report on what's been tracked. Is that, is that my, that's yeah. my understanding? So, we have, a man so we, we have a management console where we report on who sent the tracker into you guys. So instead of this flying out, you would see, you know, the person who sent the tracker to you guys, their internal recipient, subject line of that email, date and time. And then if we knew what type of tracking mechanism uh, it was, we could actually show you that. Um, and then we have a threat recon dashboard where what we'll do is we will show you where in the world we've stopped that information from leaving your environment as a, uh, as a result of those trackers. And that silencer program is that um, it's licensed per user, right? So every mailbox we're we're monitoring and and basically um, protecting that information from being leaked out. Correct. So it's warm bodied email users will cover, you know, production mailboxes and shared mailboxes at no cost. So warm butts in the seat, sending and receiving email. Okay. And I see there's like a, uh, on the right side of that, 86% Washington, but what is that where the information is being just, to do? That's or? just the, that's where the location is of the recipient opening the email. Crazy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Looks like Elizabeth's asking. Yeah. And it looks, are there reports? Yeah. And you know what, Elizabeth, give me one second. I can show you what those look like. Yeah, I'm glad you guys have reports. That's usually one of the things a lot of these applications leave behind is a lot of great real-time information and things like that. But how do you uh, how do you pull that back? Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's valuable information too. How is the product licensed? It's licensed per warm-bodied user per month uh, on an annual contract. Like any. Any person or like actual like any any, any email user. Um, any email. How user. many? Okay. Yeah. So I mean, depending on what the uh, the distribution is. So you know, how many non knowledge workers would you say you had? Uh, we have about twenty five hundred knowledge your workers. Head. Yeah, yeah, about twenty five hundred knowledge workers and 
we have probably another 4,000 non-knowledge workers, you know, just people who have email that just check it for uh, communication, uh, like business communication, maybe about it. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, usually we will waive those if they don't send outbound emails. Um, so those will just be, you know, covered at the uh, knowledge worker level. Okay. So, um, guys, Elizabeth asked a, uh, another question, and I just want to you know, make sure we, we answer that while we're going into the reports. Um, and Elizabeth asked, what about shared emails? Um, Elizabeth, if you don't mind, um, just explaining you know, what you mean so I can uh, answer that at a, a higher level. Yeah. And you can unmute yourself. Yes, it's just 365 allows you to have shared mailboxes. Sorry, that's why I was muted. My dog barks a lot. Um, oh, it's okay. And so those oftentimes are unlicensed, but like info yeah, at alexa.com or something like that, are those charged for? No, they're not, and they're covered too. Okay. So here's the reporting feature. This is the silencer tool where we rip out the trackers. So as you can see, you'll click in to a name or you can search anyone. I went to a conference so you can see um, I'm just being inundated with these. So you can see subject line, external sender, internal recipient, date and time. You hover over the tool and it'll show you what that tool is trying to purse from you guys in regards to metadata. You can export all this data via CSV and it'll show you the total email scanned potential tracking attempts. These numbers typically don't add up because there are usually two to three different tracking strategies per email, just in case you guys do, set, do not load uh, an image per email because they want to make sure all their trackers fire. We bucket them in three ways, individual, bulk, and behavioral, other trackers. The individual ones are ones people are actually putting on a specific email. You can see your top targets, top sending domains here, top tracking tools, and then here you can go ahead and hit the plus sign, load top 10 key employees. So you have a hot view on them key subject line words that you want to see why people are tracking those emails. And then you can also load competitor domains to see why they may be tracking you for you know, a specific purpose. Up here, you can go ahead and search for any subject line hot word, any email address internally uh, or third party you may think be, you know, could be tracking you guys or don't want to be tracking and then replies to tracked emails here. You can actually click and view all and see just emails going back and forth that were people were trying to track. So part of the silencer reporting tool is this recon block dashboard. So we'll show you where in the world, or first of all, what client we've stopped from leaving the organization, and then what version of that client uh, we've stopped. Here, this is the scary part. This is how specific and actionable these trackers are. You can see this is where in the world we've stopped our information from leaving is a result of these trackers. So they're so specific and actionable where you can go down to a single city square block and see the exact email or the exact location of, you know, let's say this is our employee here. So you click on it and it's funny what types of emails people are tracking. Someone is tracking a, a proposal that we sent, one of my business uh, reps had sent to a, a different company, but this is the different type of information that's being released that we've stopped um, from leaving the organization. So you take a, a worldwide view, and if you don't have operations in specific countries um, and you see emails being opened up over here, you can drill in on that email, see who the internal recipient was, and then investigate, do I have a BEC? So, you know, very interesting tool. Um, also, you know, great for risk teams to, you know, sit in after you run this 
and then say, hey, you know, click on there, he dot, say, hey, do you want this location leaving the organization as a result of you opening the, the email, whether they're at home or traveling. Any questions too? Um, you know, actually I will show you quickly the Codebreaker dashboard functionality, just so you can see. So you have visibility into Codebreaker, your average alert ratio. Um, so we're only tagging 9% of external emails. So people actually pay attention to the warnings. The average alert ratio per inbox you can see emails that have passed, emails with alerts per day. Again, keep in mind, this is not another blocking layer. We never stop or block, it, uh, block any email. We only look at the email after, you know, let's say Iron Ports you know, said, this is good to go for your end users. Here's your types of alerts triggered. So you can see the different types of alerts that had fired within the given week and the percentage increase. Here's our global whitelist where you can safe list any domain that are uh, fr uh, frequently triggering any warnings and then it would bypass without any warnings you can then see and also we have anti-spoofing in place here so we do checks every email that comes in even if it's on this list and then you know if it fails to check we'll populate a warning any emails that have been reported or marked safe you can see the user actions and blacklist this at the gateway if that's something you do and then you can also turn specific rules on and off as an admin and click and unclick that box. Then you can also customize the base message on any warning. And then, you know, in case you need to dumb it down for your users or you communicate specific, you know, IT initiatives to your, uh, to your folks in specific languages. So that's the reporting functionality. Um, any other questions from that? Any follow on questions? I think it was a good overview and I love the product. Message controls does uh, some really cool things that I never really thought of before. So uh, that's the that's the exciting eye opener of it. Yeah, and we, we like to keep it, you know, the platform uh, simple and the the way people interact with it uh, almost intuitive so you know this this does uh, appeal typically to to all industry shapes sizes of different types of users you know we've had a, a 10,000 person manufacturing company turn it on for everyone after their two weeks of learning you know and we've had smaller larger organizations to you know roll it out as slow as you know two or three weeks or you know, two months to get it to every department and, you know, individually, individually train them. But, you know, Vince usually mentions um, message control. What we do is we send out a, uh, a one page slide and you just copy and paste it, send it out to the uh, you know, entire users two weeks or so before you turn on the warnings for, for them just to understand what to expect when the warnings, you know, give you guys two minutes back of your day. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, and then, you know, feel free to uh, circle around with uh, any of us here uh, for follow on questions. All right. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Right. Thanks, guys. Guys, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks. Right. Bye. Bye.